I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future material science and engineering. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host Taylor Sparks, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about sensors and how we actually measure the things that we use to control the production of materials. We always talk about you know, temperature and pressure and various other sorts of things that you can monitor and use to change a the outcome of material. A lot of thermodynamic quantities are going to be based on those. A lot of kinetic processes are also controlled by temperature and pressure. But we rarely talk about how you actually go about controlling those. and How do you go about controlling them accurately? As well as what are the consequences of not controlling them? Yeah, it you know, there's been some really high profile failures that have had to do with exactly this topic of temperature and pressure not being monitored carefully and it leading to either an explosion or something drastic happening. In fact, there was just one that I was going to point to in 2017 that happened in St. Louis, Missouri. This was at the Loy Lang Box Company. Uh, the United States Chemical Safety Board has a series of really awesome explanations of when disasters like this happen. In this case, there was four people that actually died here. And this company makes corrugated cardboard. And as a part of that process, they had this big pressure vessel where they put superheated water and they had oxygen and they oxygenated this water. So they're actually sort of just like you can have carbon dioxide in your soda pop that you drink. You can do the same thing with oxygen. You can put, you can dissolve oxygen into water. And it's not maybe surprising that that makes for a really corrosive environment. And so they were putting that oxygenated water into a steel vessel, and that is going to be corroding. They're supposed to put oxygen scrubbers into it, things that can pull that oxygen out. Um, and there's, there's processes in place for uh, venting that system, but they just weren't being done correctly. And so corrosion was happening and so this specific company, there had actually been a number of indicators of leaking over time. They saw actually some dripping coming through. There was clearly like some rust forming. And so at one point, they'd actually cut the bottom off this big tank, which was pretty large. Like it's, it's larger than a person. I mean, it'd be sort of like picture like a water heater in your home. It was something akin to that size. They had cut the bottom out of it and replaced the metal pan, but they didn't replace all the portion that had been corroded, just part of it. Anyways, there's instances now where, you know, now that in hindsight, they've done a really careful study and they've shown that clearly there was an uncontrolled corrosion reaction happening in this pressure vessel. There was an ineffective repair. There were gaps in the inspection process and there, the process for actually managing the safety was totally inadequate as well. All this led to a, you know, this vessel with this superheated water inside of it. When the, the rupture took place, now you have room temperature air, you know, entering this atmosphere where you had superheated water. So it's going to instantly convert to steam. Now that the pressure is no longer containing it. And in that process, there's a big volume expansion and you essentially created a missile, right? And it led to the, the death of these four people really tragically. So all this is to point out that just because we're material scientists and you think like, well, what can go wrong if, you know, I'm, I'm making materials and worst thing will happen is I end up with a product that I can't sell. That's not quite right, right? Because you can actually be putting yourself in dangerous way if you're not, you know, monitoring the actual process of making materials itself. So to that end, we wanted to talk to a company, Jeffran, uh, and you'll meet some of their employees in a moment, who are making materials that allow you to not only make these measurements of temperature and pressure, but make corrections in real time. Because it'd be one thing if you were looking at a, a measurement on a screen that showed that the temperature is rising, if you were going to look at that and then by the time that you started to make observe that it's wrong and start to make the adjustment, well, how much are you going to know to, say, reduce the electrical current that's causing the heating? That's a really tricky thing. I remember the first time I learned about PID loops, 
If you're not familiar with PID, a PID controller, well, the PID stands for Proportional Integral Derivative Controller. And essentially, instead of just looking at the absolute value of the signal that you're measuring, whether that's temperature or pressure or something else, it's actually looking at the derivatives. It's looking at the, the rate of change of those things. So really carefully, if you want to you know, increase your temperature from 50 degrees to 70 degrees, instead of just turning a knob and sort of wildly, like you're flying an airplane, you know, swinging too high and then too low, it's actually really in a very accurate way, um, picking the exact signal that you need to get the, the resulting process out of it. So PID is still, I believe, a pretty common tool that's used in most controllers. Is that right, Andrew? Yeah, at, at the very least for temperature controllers, most furnaces that are using those small little uh, digital, almost analog looking controllers are, are still PID controllers. Okay. Maybe that's changed, but I, I believe that is still very much an industry standard um, method of controlling um, various processes. Now, okay. when you get to things like safety sensors, those can usually be those can be a little bit different in the sense that they're not necessarily trying to control a process as they are just um, they have a threshold, and once that's surpassed, they send an electrical signal. Yeah, or they can even be mechanical. I remember one of the early problems I had on a homework way back in the day when I was taking my materials science course was a shear pin, right? Where under a certain shear stress, the pin would shear, it would break across and allow the pressure to degas before it got to the catastrophic one that would cause the vessel to rupture. So you're intentionally, and this is why it's so important to understand materials failure, right? You're designing it to fail as a safety mechanism, which I thought was pretty slick. Um, that said, this is all sort of depending, you know, you've got these control systems that can tune your temperature and pressure accordingly so you stay safe, but that all depends on you being able to measure temperature and pressure. Andrew, it's not the most straightforward thing in the world to measure temperature and pressure. Are you familiar with how they work? I think I have a nice conceptual understanding, but could I design one myself? It would take a little <laughs> bit of work. Yeah, let's start with temperature measurements. Um, there's different, obviously, ways to measure temperature, and some of them are really sophisticated. Let's just talk about the two most common ones that I'm aware of. The first one is just going to be your thermocouple. Um, so these are not like the sort of thermometers that you're thinking of if you cook at home, right, where you can dip it in the liquid and you see, hopefully not the mercury, but some other substance rise in the sort of glass beaker. This isn't that. A thermocouple, instead of relying on a fluid expansion that's related to a temperature change, and that fluid then goes across a scale, and you can read it like a, like a like a ruler, as it were. It does something different. You're getting an electrical signal out of it. So how do you get an electrical signal from a something like a thermal process? Well, <laughs> the name sort of gives it away. You're going to use something like a thermoelectric, right? There's actually um, devices called thermocouples, and these are just two different types of metal. And if you put them together in the presence of a temperature difference across one end to the other, so, so if you heat the metallurgical junction what you will observe is that you will have a difference in temperature across the other two ends of the metal. So this is the exact same thing that happens inside of a thermoelectric device. If you listen to our previous episode way back on thermoelectric materials, this is how they work. We harness that voltage that gets produced to actually extract power from a system in the case of a power thermoelectric generator. But it's, it's the exact same principle. If one end is heated and the other end is not, then you get a voltage that you can measure. So they can use that voltage to actually determine the temperature. The only catch is that knowing the from first principles exactly what the voltage will be depending on the temperature range given is not like an easy thing to know. So instead, what they typically do is have an empirical relationship or essentially like a lookup table. Somebody knew what the temperatures were. You put your thermocouple in contact with it. So now you know what the temperature difference is from as your ground truth. You observe the voltage. And you do this as you increase temperature and then you essentially fit a curve to it and you use that fitted curve as a lookup table for determining what now the new voltage is from your thermocouple reading. Obviously, every, you know, there's different types of thermocouples. Maybe some of our listeners have bought these. There's type J, there's type K, there's type R. And these typically, what, what that means is that it's telling you what types of materials come together to make that metallurgical junction. Is it platinum and something else? Is it copper and something? Is iron and something? That's all has to do with what the nomenclature is. And they're typically used in different temperature ranges. Yeah, that was always my understanding was that these define uh, the temperature range at which you're going to be operating. Mm -hmm. Now, the second uh, common way that we measure temperature is through uh, infrared radiation emission, right? So uh, if you've taken a electronic properties of solids class, you probably learned about black body radiation at some point. 
uh, if you haven't, then if you've seen a light bulb, an incandescent light bulb, then you have observed black body radiation as you heat something up, in this case, the light bulb filament, as it gets hot enough, it just glows. Now, light bulbs in our modern area are pretty simple. They just glow bright at a perfect temperature that has already been set. And so the, the brightness or the whiteness is sort of fixed. But in the early days, or if you've ever seen a piece of wire get heated up slowly, it doesn't go straight to white. Instead, it doesn't start glowing at all. And then when it does, it's sort of a dull orange and then a red, and it eventually turns to that white color. Um, the wavelength that's coming off is changing, right? And in some, at first you don't see it at all because our eyes, we can only see a pretty, pretty minuscule section of the electromagnetic spectrum. But it's clear that as you saw it go from an orange to a red to a white, that that's related to a temperature change and you can see it with your own eye. So the other way that they measure temperature is with a more sophisticated version of an eye, essentially. It's measuring the wavelength of energy coming off an object as it's heated up. This is the infrared emission, right? And again, there's a lookup table that you can use that will determine the temperature of the object based off of the light that it's emitting. And that's your infrared measurement of temperature as well. Oh, yeah. And I mean, once you get up into the temperature range uh, where thermocouples can't really operate or you kind of risk doing damage to them, those are the only ways you can get temperature readings. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we've got a home-built SPS system that's spark plasma sintering. Again, we have a couple episodes. <laughs> Check those out if you want, if you want to learn more about that. But on in that type of device, we actually rely on both thermocouples and a optical measurement. Uh, so we have a thermocouple that we have, we drilled a little tiny hole inside of our material, our die, and we put the thermocouple in contact with the innermost portion of it that we dare to get to. And then we have another hole on the other side of the device, which we point our inferometer at, and it's able to measure the light coming out of that little tiny hole. And it's interesting, as you center this device, the dyes actually are compressing and moving a little bit. And so you actually have to move the aim of that optical measurement so that it stays fixed on the tiny hole, right? Because if the die moves yeah. and all of a sudden you're not pointing at the hole, well, the outside of the dye is going to be much colder than the inside. And so sometimes you'll see this huge jump in the temperature from your optical measurement. And it's pretty clear that what happened is that you stopped looking at the little tiny hole that you were supposed to be looking at. So do you have to adjust it mid-process? Yeah. So normally mm -hmm. during heat up, it helps if you've got an extra person on hand that can be watching that and keeping that dialed in um, while the other person is running the, the other parts of the process. Gotcha. So, and that's so a big quite... problem. You know, like we talk about safety, you know, even if you're measuring it, if you're, you have some misalignment and all of a sudden the thing that's controlling your PID controller is reading a cold spot or something and it just oh, starts yeah. amping up <laughs> that current, you know, it's a big yeah. problem. It is. I've definitely had it happen before. We actually melted a sample like crazy and we thought that we were just fine. We pull it out and it has been completely obliterated, totally melted it. And we realized, oh shoot, it must've actually been looking at the felt lining, which is meant to be a sort of a protector. It's right. It's meant to absorb this infrared light coming off your sample so that your, your vessel doesn't get too hot. And our, our infrared camera must've been pointing at that instead of at the hole. And it caused our sample to get completely obliterated. And we didn't know about it until afterwards. And that's why so, a lot of uh, industrial practices use redundant sensors. Bingo. You know, to, to account for this, to account for the fact that if there is a, a miscalibration, you know, not only could that cost the company millions of dollars, but it could cost people their lives. Oh, totally. And at first I was annoyed with it because the thermocouple didn't always match the pyrometer measurement, right? They would be off by a little bit. And so it's just like, well, which one is it, <laughs> right? Um, but in hindsight, having that second sort of foolproof, you know, double check that things are going like you think they are is really valuable, actually, I think. So that's temperature measurement. Now we have to think about pressure measurements. So how are you going to measure pressure? Um, so again, just like there's two main ways of measuring temperature, there's two main ways of measuring pressure. The first is with piezo-resistive strain gauges. If you've ever heard of a Wheatstone bridge, which maybe some of our listeners have heard of, um, these are of that type. And essentially what's going on here is, you know, Andrew, if I took a wire and I hooked up, uh, you know, electrical, a multimeter to the ends of a wire, and if I pulled on that wire a little bit, I strained it, technically the resistivity of that sample would have changed a little bit, right? Now, oftentimes the amount of deformation needs to be really big to get a big measurement that you can easily read, or your wire needs to be really, really long, right? So that you can essentially the resistance is large over the length of a long wire. And so uh, the way that they get around this with strain gauges is by making in pretty miniature scale, a serpentine pattern of a resistive material, such that when this plate 
or this, you know, the, the sensor itself gets strained, the overall plate is going to change dimension and you've printed this wire along it in a long serpentine path. So even though it's occupying a pretty small footprint, you have quite a bit of length of your wire that's all going to be expanding or contracting depending on what the pressure is doing. So you can actually get a, a measurable difference in the resistance from it and relate that to your pressure in just the same way that we do with temperature using essentially a lookup table that you have defined ahead of time. Another way that they do this though, instead of using piezo-resistive strain gauges, is there are capacitance pressure transducers. We haven't talked a lot about capacitors on this show before. I think we will on a future episode uh, specifically related to piezoelectric materials, but if you've taken an intro to physics course, you probably learned about a parallel plate capacitor. If you haven't, then picture two pieces of metal, and as you um, bring them close together but not touching, and you hook a battery up so the positive and negative are on either side of those plates of metal, if they're not touching, then you can't pass current through the system. There's no electrical current running through this loop. But as they get closer and closer, what you will do is you will accumulate positive and negative charges on the two different plates. And as you bring them closer together, that amount of charge that you accumulate will increase. So the way that these pressure transducers work is they take advantage of the fact that as the plates get closer and closer, you're going to accumulate more charge along these electrodes and you can measure that charge, that surface charge. And so that becomes your signal that you're going to use is essentially the, the voltage between these two plates as they get squeezed closer together or further apart as the pressure changes. And I'm sure there's lots of other interesting configurations that people have come up with and depending on the application or the, the cost. Oh yeah. I'm one of the ones I'm familiar with is actually a guy in our department, Jeff Bates. He, he and I were working on some water sensors and we actually came up with a hydrogel, which is a polymer that swells in the presence of water in a mm -hmm. fairly predictable way. And so we took a steel mesh on one side and put these pressure. So you start out with dirt, maybe you're trying to measure the water content of dirt. So you take your dirt, you take a metal mesh, you take your hydrogel and put it on the other side, and then you put the whole thing up against your pressure transducer such that when the hydrogel swells, it can't push into the steel mesh any further. So it's going to have to push the other direction into the pressure transducer. And so you can actually get a water uh, hydration measurement by using this in conjunction with a pressure transducer. That was a nice little introduction to sensors, but now maybe we should go talk to some of the experts in the field. talk more about how we can prevent these sorts of accidents in the future, uh, we need to learn about the types of sensors that can be giving us the information that engineers could take action on. And to do that, this episode is sponsored by Jeffren. And from Jeffren, we have Joe Vasco and David Newell. Do you want to introduce yourselves, guys? Sure. Uh, Joe, I'll go first. Uh, my name is David Newell, uh, a plastics industry pr participant, for lack of a better way to put it, for about 40 years now. Um, Background is extrusion, injection, molding, uh, compounding of many kinds, including uh, rubber and uh, uh, wet coatings as well. Uh, primarily interested in uh, uh, quality control and and safety mechanisms throughout the career, and uh, it's, it's primarily been focused on uh, assisting customers in batch to batch sustainability uh, across the board so that they could remain viable suppliers to their customers. Okay. And you, Joe? My name's Joe Vasco. I'm an application engineer with Jeffran. I've been with the company for 15 years. And for 20 years prior, I worked for a machine manufacturer. My job is to work with customers to find solutions to their problems and help them make a better pr produced product and work with them the best of their abilities to solve problems. Okay, so if our listeners have not heard of Jeffrey before, clearly we've mentioned that you make sensors, things like temperature sensors and pressure sensors, but you do more than that. You have systems actually for taking information from those sensors and actually providing you know feedback loops to maybe you want to reduce the temperature or you want to reduce some pressure or you want to increase those things. So you've got control systems that you offer. You have the systems themselves and you have the software that helps can run it. Um, are there other things that you want to tell us about the company? 
Joe, I'll defer to you. You've been with the company longer, have a deeper understanding. Jeffrin is a company that's actually been around for close to 40 years. It was started by two brothers who found a need for better control for the injection molding industry. So on the temperature control side of that was the initial starting point. From that point, Jeff Rand grew instead of just being a simple company that made temperature controllers, they grew to add pressure controls, different types of sensors, and they even added a whole separate division for motion control. So over time, their task has been to uh, solve customer problems and work with that and grow the business together as a partner. I was going to say, there's a lot of companies out there that make sensors. What makes Jeffrin special? David, do you want to address yeah, that? Yeah, I'll, sure. I'll field that one. And what I'm going to say, I think uh, Joe will, will agree, uh, pertains to all of our product lines, which are, uh, are, are different industry serving. But on the sensors side, particularly on the um, plastics melt sensor side, <clears throat> Jeff Rand is primarily concerned with producing a state-of-the-art product from the outset. They don't come in and try and be a, a, be a copycat in any application whatsoever. Uh, their goal from, the, from the, their inception uh, that I have learned is to be a premier supplier from the get-go. And in that regard, they have succeeded. They have an excellent name in the uh, uh, in, in the global marketplace in all their applications and are probably considered one of the top three global suppliers in any of those applications as a result of that successful effort. So in material science, we often interest ourselves in the sort of the, the so-called tetrahedron of material science, which is that this discipline is defined by understanding relationships. And those relationships are between the structure of material, the processing of material, the properties of material, and its application, right, which is going to be related to its performance, right? So in what parts of those, uh, you know, in what parts of that tetrahedron do we see the need for sensors? When it, I'll field this one, when it, um, first and foremost, and this is strictly a personal observation after 40 years in the business, it's, it's all about safety first. Um, it, it, these, many of these products, um, inception came about uh, post-industrial revolution, midway through the industrial revolution in the 1900s, when there was a, a high increasing demand for uh, rubber, plastics, chemically put together products, compounded products of many kinds. And suppliers would reverse engineer solutions as to ways to bring these products to market. But in that process, safety was not a large concern. And while none of them invited industrial accidents, using power equipment uh, at high speed, high temperature, uh, resulting in high friction and high pressure, oftentimes produced safety uh, concerns or worse, uh, with being industrial accidents. So initially, many of these products were created to help control the process, monitor the process, particularly at high levels of attributes I talked about before, pressure, temperature, um, that kind of thing. Because once you get up into that genre, you are inviting <clears throat> an industrial accident of many kinds. So they would need to determine what was a safety point, what was a danger point, have the proper sensing equipment to monitor it and keep that in place from happening. So that's really number one. And around the 19, throughout the 1950s and 60s, post-World War II and that very strong um, industrial environment, these products were developed. After that, they were learned to be quality control tools and you were able to control the quality of your batched mixed compounded product uh, via the use of pressure sensing, temperature sensing, uh, and, and in very simply put, if you under-pressurize, under-temperature mix or compound, or to use a generic term, cook a, a compound, it's going to come out under-mixed and it's going, to come, it's going to underperform. It's not going to mold properly. If it's coating, it's not going to dry properly. If it's a rubber, it's not going to perform properly. And conversely, if you over-mix any of it, um, it's not going to perform properly. It's going to be too brittle, too hard. Um, it won't mold at all. It'll crack and break quickly. So it's very, there's a critical low and a high area of all of those uh, root applications that 
is important to learn and to know and to maintain within to be able to put out batch to batch consistent product time after time. And a lot of industries that these sensors are being used in have specific standards for their products. I know the aerospace industry has a number of standards that they expect their materials to be at, but also things like the pharmaceutical industry as well. Is that right? Correct. Uh, you know, some of our controls meet the different standards, so we do have controls specific to that as well as the sensors that match that. As you alluded to, the you know, aerospace industries use the ASM 2750 standard. The automotive uses the CQI-9, and then the FDA or pharmaceutical uses uh, Section 21 CFR Part 11. So all those different industries have different specific requirements, and they basically come down to the quality of the control and the precision of the control. And the Jeffrey and controls and sensors are able to meet those requirements. And how does that affect the maybe the sensor design or the how it's integrated into the end application? The, each, it's a great question. Each sensor is application specific. For instance, we're manufacturing sensors not only into uh, plastics compounding and or rubber compounding, we're also manufacturing into motion control applications or linear position applications. Entirely different, all three entirely different industrial applications so the sensor must be designed to what has reverse engineered been determined to be the specific need for the application. So a great deal of uh, scientific approach goes into the research and development effort, first understanding what the need of the customer is, and then determining what your sensor is going to have to do to successfully meet this need. And those are your two criteria you meet, and those are the two goals that you uh, keep focusing on as you get through R and D uh, and get to final product. So, you know, I've never worked with sensors, not really, anyways, and so I sort of just took for granted that they would be available, that they would work, they would they would survive the environments in which they're going to be used. But that's not always the case, right? Um, in chatting and learning about your company, we've learned that there's actually quite a bit of customization that you offer for customers that have unique environments. Can you describe some of the things that you've seen along the way? Uh, yes, um, many of the, uh, we, we can take polymer compounding, for instance, uh, some customers will work, we'll be working with a, a generic polymer that, uh, yes, per an ASTM standard, will have the same operating temperature prescribed and have the same pr operating pressure prescribed. But oftentimes, and really more often than not, those customers will, in order to develop a niche in the marketplace, want to develop a specialty for their compound. And in doing so, they will incorporate uh, different additives into their compound. And now you are coming out of anywhere where an ASTM standard exists other than the base polymer that you're working with. And, and through chemical engineering, you need to determine what those additives you're adding in are going to do in terms of increasing temperature, uh, pressure, um, creating friction, mixing time, etc., and you're going to need to develop new standards that can only be done through uh, a thought process uh, from a, a CE side, a chemical chemical engineering side, uh, but also through trial and error. And uh, once you do that, you can uh, begin to have the right additive products to go with it. What are some of them? On a low side, you could be introducing some pigments that are uh, slightly abrasive, such as any whitening compound made of a TiO2, which is actually a very small sphere, but very hard and can be abrasive um, as it passes by various metal parts, all the way up to very uh, serious abrasive and even caustic compounds where they have, uh, they've incorporated them into the polymer to, to, because it's what's required to mold their finished product, but they can be quite uh, abrasive and, uh, and diminishing on the parts inside of the uh, mixing equipment and, and, and the barrel and the sensors and therefore you must incorporate things like specialized steel alloys to the tip of the sensors and other parts in order to stand up to the material that's now asked to be mixed. Do you have any specific case studies of, of where you've had to adjust your, um, where you've had to adjust your, your, your sensors or maybe the, the design of them or the application to meet some of these extreme conditions? Sure. Um, a, a, a recent example of a, a very extreme one. Uh, 
is a global electronics manufacturer that um, everyone would know of. Uh, needing, they were producing a their own packaging foam, and uh, in their ability to be their continuing need to be self integrated, they were producing packaging foam for their finished electronics to to go into to be to be shipped in cartons in, and that foam. Um, was a challenge to be formulated in terms of the way it needed to mold and the way they needed it to dry. And in essence, uh, through their their production line process, they needed it to finish curing uh, after they had loaded the the electronic component into it. So in other words, they would put the electronic component into it and it it would take the shape of the outside of the electronic component and finish curing right to it so that it was a very secure package to ship. Well, that foam uh, was a, a caustic mix of uh, a base polymer and wet chemicals, um, and one of those wet chemicals being an acid-based product. And as most people know, any acid-based product that comes in contact with any metal whatsoever um, is going to uh, begin to rot that metal very quickly uh, because the two just don't mix. They're like oil and water. And so we were able to produce a... Uh, an alloy tip, a, a, a Hastelloy C270 tip, something very common in the marketplace. Uh, but we were able to, to make our tips out of that instead of the standard 15.5 stainless that would be degraded quickly. And the customer had been using our sensors with the 15.5 stainless, so they weren't lasting very long because the uh, caustic solution was quite high in acid content. And when we introduced the, C- the Hastelloy C270, Roughly eight months ago, nine months ago, uh, they've yet to have a problem with it since, and it seems to be working fine. So that's a good success story, and that's a typical success story. And the only way we would have known that is to ask the customer uh, what's in your compound without giving away any uh, proprietary information. What are you mixing in? What's happening? Let's try to figure out what's degrading that stainless steel. And once they started to talk about it in generic terms, we knew pretty quickly, okay, we need to go with a, a, a compounded alloy tip that's going to stand up to what they're doing it because we can't go back and ask them to change their compound. They've already found a successful way to do what they want to do. So at that point, it's our job to, to adapt to their needs. Yeah. Case study wise and a different application, similar, we've had customers that we'll call it part of the pressure control and part of the safety control. We have melt pressure systems, which are a combination of using the sensor that's controlling the process at a very high speed for the extruder drive that's driving a motor. So we had a customer that was doing compounding. So they're taking base materials and partially recycled materials, which can be somewhat abrasive, putting it through an extruder and which is then melting it, then coming out of a die to make uh, polymer tips. The problem they were having was an inconsistent flow. So that would cause jamming further down the line where the, if you want to think of it like uh, spaghetti uh, noodles coming out of the end of machine, there's a, a knife coming around cutting it off and consistently, so it's, it doesn't get gummed up on the tip, it needs to, the flow needs to be controlled. So we used one of our temperature controllers and high speed controllers to solve the problem. It actually did two things. It controlled the motor drive, which was in this case, a big 200 horsepower drive. And within five milliseconds, it could change or adjust to pressure changes. So if there was any problem with the feed of the material coming through, it would immediately adjust to it and provided a more consistent compound and more consistent product. So in this case, it was a pelletizing line where a customer was putting in uh, material that was inconsistent and it was also part of its uh, dye color to match it. And we were able to solve the solution by providing both a melt pressure sensor and then this controller, our uh, 2500 unit, that controlled the high speed process directly and was able to solve the problem for the customer. Okay, so clearly we need to measure things like pressure and temperature if we're going to understand process control and materials. But we haven't yet said how actually those work. And maybe some people are curious. Do you want to describe to us how a thermocouple actually works and how is pressure actually being measured in your actual sensors themselves? Joe, you want to go with this one? or, or Do you want to talk about the strain gauge on the pressure sensors? Sure. 
Um, the the way the pressure sensors are were designed and um, successful design. When I talked earlier about the the uh, being produced as a safety me- mechanism back in the early 1950s, they were they were two professors from uh, MIT in Boston that were uh, were uh, charged with uh, trying to produce some kind of a product to monitor pressure in what those days was rubber extrusion primarily because the uh, the Northeast was uh, very strong in that industry and uh, they were they were uh, asked to try and come up with something to to solve this considerable safety problem and around 1950 and 51 they came up with the first ones and uh, uh, through a design that still exists today uh, there is a, a something called a strain gauge that's um, it's made of various materials but it's a it's a soft cotton material with some wiring and it um, it's embedded behind, it's at the, at the very tip of the sensor with a very thin 15.5 stainless over the top of it. And the strain gauge swells and contracts and expands and contracts with pressure and temperature. And, and that, that reading is, is, is sensed, that sensing is sensed through the 15.5 stainless tip, which also kind of waffles, expands and contracts a little bit. And then as that reads that, uh, that that sensing as it senses and goes by and does its its uh, as the tip swells and contracts the strain gauge directly behind it reads that that change in 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 feeling if you will as pressure and then through it through a series of algorithms that information is uh, sent up using using a filler material uh, usually mercury, but but now these days you can do it with oil and you can do it with sodium potassium as well, and uh, that it's sent up in a in a temperature uh, range, and as that temperature range through the mercury fill very small amount reaches the electronics at the top, it is sensed and converted through a series of algorithms to pressure, um, and we also are able to in this industry embed a thermocouple into the sensing tip down near the strain gauge and just below the surface. And uh, a similar activity takes place where the temperature is sensed and uh, sent up the, uh, the embedded thermocouple as well. And both readings can be taken at the surface. And Joe, if you can improve on that, please do. Yeah, along the line of sensors, thermocouple is basically two dissimilar metals that create a millivolt signal when they're just joined mechanically. Um, the most common industries, sorry about that noise in the background, let's try it. Thermocouples are another type of sensor that are basically two dissimilar metals. The two dissimilar metals, when they're joined mechanically, create a small millivolt signal. So one of the most common thermocouple types is J-type thermocouple, which is simply made up of iron and constantin, or basically a copper nickel uh, alloy base. When they're mechanically joined or soldered at the tip, they create a small millivolt signal. And as the temperature changes, that millivolt signal changes. Now that signal is not a linear signal. So based on temperature, there is a specific value that corresponds to a temperature. So temperature controllers then have to adjust for the type of material or the thermocouple type, which is one type of sensors that's used and know what that means as far as temperature. Uh, similarly, yeah. there's also RTDs or resistance thermocouples, which are linear in their action, that also make a small millivolt signal and uh, adjust for temperature. So, all that the simple process of you know that we've had thermocouples around for years. For example, in you know the gas piloted operated uh, furnaces that many people have in their homes, there is a mechanical thermocouple in there that creates a millivolt signal that keeps the gas valve basically operating as long as it sees the, you know, the right temperature in the flame sensor. Um, the, so the controls take that base signal and then if we will, we say we look at it and we Im- improve the control op- and the, uh, based on the, the background information. Yeah, if our listeners will remember, we did a previous episode on thermoelectrics where we talked about the Zabeck effect, where you get this voltage produced by having junctions of dissimilar metals. Uh, you know, it's interesting that you point out that these are nonlinear. And so it's not just as simple as like, you know, get one or two data points. They really have to empirically solve this, don't they? You have to actually know very carefully what the actual temperature is. And I'm not totally sure how they're doing that, if it's with IR, you know, measurements or, or something else. But 
you basically calibrate your voltage response to what the temperature difference is, and then you just fit it to some sort of curve empirically and use that going forward as your as your sort of ground truth for that. Um, and then obviously that would depend on d different thermocouple junctions are made of different materials. So they're going to have their own different empirical data that you're going to have to fit it to to actually get a measurement out of it. Yep, you're exactly correct on that. So what happens in the background of the controller, there's basically a lookup table. So for a J-type thermocouple, like I alluded to, there are specific values that correspond to a specific temperature. And part of the controls process, you have to be within a certain point of, on the accuracy. So we're talking very small signal differences, you know, based on a temperature difference that corresponds to a chart that's all built into the firmware of the control. So all these things are handled in the background or, and are basically well, almost commonplace and automatic, but there is a big strong background of what's happened in the back to make that work. Talking about accuracy of the measurements and, and the, the ability for there to be some drift, how does Jeffren handle, I guess, sensor redundancy? Is that something that is important or is that something that customers ask for? Uh, as in having multiple thermocouples to ensure that you're getting, you know, one of them isn't deficient, for instance, or multiple pressure sensors. Is that something that's very common or not so much? Have sensors gotten good enough that that sort of those sorts of issues aren't as much of a problem these days? Um, Joe, I'll run with this one if you'd like. Um, it, it's a great question. And the the more I would say the more premier product the customer is making the more apt you are to find uh, redundant sensing and temperature sensing at the same point uh, in a process. Uh, uh, for instance, I was at a customer uh, earlier this year that's manufacturing product for a top tier automotive supplier uh, with a, 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 a very serious quality control acceptance procedure um, whose, whose uh, rejection of which you do not want to be a part of because it's it, it's very strict and after two or three times you could lose the account and this particular company had five uh, sensors both pressure and temperature at the same point on the extrusion line but not exactly the same spot so if you could look straight at the barrel and visualize it as a as a hollow pipe or a clock they had put them at one four seven 10 and noon or something like that. And uh, they were getting five temperature readings, five pressure readings from exactly the same model sensor uh, coming in at the same time to their control room. And that was how they were sure that they had uh, a, a decent, uniform, homogenized mix in a 360 degree circumference within the barrel because they had realized over the year over the years that taking it at one location, you can pick your spot. Let's say it was at 8 PM on a clock. If they had a sensor installed there where they were taking pressure and temperature readings, uh, they had figured out that on the other side of exactly the same space where melt flow was, or in another spot, when you're looking at it from a 360 degree standpoint, you might not have the same homogeneous mix and you might not therefore get the same readings. So they realized over time, that they needed to install them on all sides so that they knew they were getting the same pressure, same temperature, 360 degrees circumference. Therefore, they could be, have, with relative surety, uh, know what was coming through the screen into a finished product form. Sensor-wise, the other thing that's done in, when there's a need for precision or for quality, for example, in the FDA, requires both the sensor and the control to basically be certified every six months. So as I mentioned, our controls, you know, look at a signal and know what that corresponds to temperature. So this control has to be brought back to an NTIS standard and make sure that it's within its accuracy every six months. So basically, uh, an engineer comes in, hooks up a special piece of equipment to the control, types in several test points, and confirms that the control is working. So along with doing this calibration, you know that the control is working in the background, it's monitoring the data. The data is being captured by a SCADA system. So customers are able to simply see when something is not correct, when it starts going out of tolerance, before it starts making a bad product, they can actually see a sensor failing with our control. Is it always clear when it's a sensor failing versus when your product is failing, like there's something wrong with the system? 
because let's say let's say you're doing a polymer processing and so you're relying on monomers that come from somebody and you're trying to control what they ship to you but that's a little bit out of your control right and so what if they send you monomers that have changed a little bit and so your process has now changed leading to a difference in temperature pressure than you're used to seeing how do you know it's due to the monomer and not due to your sensor failing that's a very good question the sensor failing is more predictable in terms of we'll, we'll consider it like noise um, uh, different materials may shift the process uh, point high or low. When the sensor actually starts going bad, you see random spikes, if you will, where a signal is out of the range and then comes back. So based on the signal and the data that's being captured, you can determine whether it's a sensor failure that's happening or starting to happen or going to happen in the near future, or if it's just something the process isn't flowing operating as would be expected because of a difference of the base materials. It does take a little bit of uh, work by a process engineer who's familiar with the control system to understand the difference, but it is distinguishable between the types of failure or would say quality of, the, of what's happening in the process. Yeah. If a customer came to you and uh, it sounds like you use mostly, for example, thermocouples for temperature measurements, but if they wanted an optical measurement using, you know, infrared or something, could, are you capable of adjusting your system to, you know, rely on a different input like that? Correct. Our temperature controllers or any of our process controllers all accept a wide range of signals. So we have thermocouples, which are the nonlinear. We have PT100, which is a linear type sensor. But then we also can work with, as you mentioned, the infrared type sensors, which typically have a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. And that corresponds to a chart um, as well. So we can work with any of those processes, for example, similar, slightly out of this material area, but doing the curing of solar cells, uh, you're looking at a solar silicon wafer and you're controlling the temperature in the oven on that point, And you are using an infrared thermocouple. You're not actually touching the, the product, but you're looking at the surface of the product to see what the temperature is. I feel like sensors have been around for a while, and I think they're going to play a, an increasingly important role, especially as safety is certainly a concern for industry, but data and data acquisition and data analysis has also become just an incredibly important part of materials processing, and it's going to continue to be that. What do you see as the future of sensors in, in industry, and how do you think they're going to evolve? We're actually kind of seeing part of that evolution now. Uh, as you mentioned, everything is about the capturing of data for quality control and for verification of process and for making sure the process is working. So since we're kind of seeing it in a twofold process, on our melt pressure sensors, we are actually adding what's referred to as one of the newer systems, IO link. So that brings along the data, if you will, of actual the pressure, but along with that pressure data, it also captures in the background of the sensor high peaks, how many times it's gone above a certain threshold, and other material information about the sensor, the extremes it's seen, and it's captured that and recorded in the background of the sensor. So you know how many hours the sensor's been in use, you know its peaks, and this becomes data that is available to the PLC or control system on an as needed request. It's not data that comes over every minute, but it's data that comes along. So we're actually seeing the shift of adding that one type of system to our pressure sensors. Similarly, on a control side, we see more and more requests for data and how can we get the data from the controller as fast as possible. So we now have interfaces to a lot of our controllers that work with the different PLC systems, whether it's the uh, Rockwell system, you, you, you know, using the Ethernet IP, whether it's Profinet or any of the other field buses that are out there. Um, so those are a, a need or a requirement that are being brought upon or requested by customers. So that's driving the design and of both the sensors and the controls. Gotcha. And David, what's your perspective on the future of sensors? Uh, I would add to all of the, 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 the great technical side of things that Joe is very proficient in. Uh, from my side, batch-to-batch -batch consistency is key uh, 
with all suppliers today. For years, it was not. Uh, they ignored <clears throat> uh, sh making scrap for whatever reasons. And um, right around around the market crash in 2007, and then now certainly post-COVID, uh, people have realized that they cannot afford to produce, nor are they in business to produce scrap product that either must be reworked or, or scrapped altogether. They're in business to produce batch-to-batch uh, -batch quality product for the customer. Uh, that is how they remain a viable, profitable business. Uh, so they don't want their extruders going down. They don't want their injection molding machines going down. Uh, they don't want um, any of their... their uh, industrial equipment with hydraulic or motion linear position sensors in them going down. They need them in service, uh, doing what they were built to do uh, on whatever basis they do it, eight hours a day, 16 hours a day, 24 hours a day. And that is uh, very important today as supply chain and so many other things have put a crimp on costs. Uh, customers have realized that their job is to remain up and running at all times and producing the same product for the customer at all times. And sensors and controllers and indicators of all kinds uh, must be a state of the art uh, and performing in the way that they need to. And the suppliers of them need to be uh, savvy enough to be able to ask the right questions when a customer says, we're having a problem and we don't know what it is. And they need to be able to ask the right questions so that they can get involved with them, reverse engineer, themselves with them to the origin of the problem and therefore craft a solution. Um, I think that's it though. Uh, anything else you guys did, wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to? Uh, not me. I'm good. I think we're good. I appreciate the effort and the work of putting this together. Yeah, me too. Okay. Thanks guys. This episode of the Materialism Podcast is sponsored by Jeffrey Incorporated, located in North Andover, Massachusetts. With over five decades of experience and nearly 700 employees worldwide, Jeffrey designs, engineers, and manufactures sensors, controls, and components for industrial equipment. OEMs, engineers, and end users rely on Jeffrey products for process control, automation, and equipment electrification in applications related to plastics, metals, glass, packaging fluid power, heat treatment, and more. In addition to standard product lines, Jeffren's vertically integrated supply chain allows the company to customize products for its OEM customers, and 14% of the workforce is dedicated to research and development. You can visit the company website at jeffren.com. Jeffren is spelled G-E-F-R-A-N. The Materialism Podcast is sponsored by Materials Today. You can visit materialstoday.com to stay up to date on the latest happenings in the material science field and read some of their fantastic articles that they've published. You can also head over to elsevier.com to find out more about their journals, books, conferences, and related programs. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Materialism Podcast. If you've got any questions or feedback, send us an email. Reach out to us. We're easy to get a hold of. You can find us at materialism.podcast at gmail.com, or we're actually much more engaged on Instagram and Twitter. So our Instagram handle is at materialism.podcast, and you can connect with us there. We also post lots of fun pictures and uh, additional stuff about the show, some behind the scenes things. So check us out there. It would really, really help us if you would leave us a five-star review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you listen to your podcast, leave us a positive review and it will help us expose the show to new people. That would be really great. Uh, finally, we want to give a big shout out to Alphabot and Colobite. They're the ones who make the really cool music that we use in this podcast. So thanks to them. We think they make good stuff and we think that you should support them. You can find their stuff on Spotify and YouTube. So with that, we will see you guys next time. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton, the makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials. <laughs>